In the history of universe, the title of the most magical and most mysterious biomolecule goes to none but DNA. DNA, the miracle molecule, is the conveyor of heredity and it is the reason behind the vast diversity of life. Everything about DNA started with the observation of heredity. Let's see this picture. You won't believe this couple to be the parents of these children. Obviously not biological parents, but maybe foster parents. The era of genetics began with such observations. These days, scientists know how you inherit characteristics from your parents. They were able to calculate probabilities of having a specific trait or getting a genetic disease according to the information they have from the parents and the family history. But how is this possible? To understand how traits pass from one living being to its descendants, we need to go back in time to the 19th century and a man named Gregor Mendel. Mendel was an Austrian monk and biologist who loved to work with plants. By breeding the pea plants he was growing in the monastery's garden, he discovered the principles that rule heredity. In one of the most classic examples, Mendel combined a purebred yellow-seeded plant with a purebred green-seeded plant, and he got only yellow seeds. He called the yellow color trait the dominant one, because it was expressed in all the new seeds. Then he let the new yellow-seeded hybrid plants self-fertilize, and in this second generation he got both yellow and green seeds, which meant that the green trait had been hidden by the dominant yellow. He called this hidden trait the recessive trait. From those results, Mendel inferred that each trait depends on a pair of factors, one of them coming from the mother and the other from the father. Now we know that these factors are called alleles and represent the different variations of a gene. These days, scientists know a lot more about genetics and heredity, and there are many other ways in which some characteristics are inherited, but it all started with Mendel and his peas. His ideas were published in 1866, but not recognized for 34 years. Later in 1900, his ideas were rediscovered and this Austrian friar became the father of genetics. In 1869, Friedrich Miescher isolated some acidic substance from soiled bandages and named them nuclein. Eventually, the nuclein was termed as deoxyribonucleic acid DNA. Countless endeavors of many scientists established DNA as the ultimate miracle molecule in later years. For example, Griffith's experiment of transformation in 1928 concluded that a chemical substance from one cell is capable of genetically transforming another cell. Then, one gene, one protein hypothesis of Beetle and Tatum in 1941. Avery MacLeod McCarthy experiment in 1944 confirmed that DNA was the transforming material in Griffith's experiment. Arwin Shergoff's postulates about purine pyrimidine ratio in 1950. Hershey and Chase experiment in 1952 determined DNA as genetic material. The big breakthrough came in 1953. DNA is in the shape of a double helix with anti-parallel nucleotide chains and specific base pairing. This was deduced by Watson and Crick, who used Rosalind Franklin's data provided by Maurice Wilkins. Well, uh, let's dig a little deeper in this scenario. In 1950, the famous Rosalind Franklin received a three-year fellowship for pursuing researches at the Biophysics Unit of King's College. Franklin was supposed to establish a department of crystallography and do studies on proteins. But Maurice Wilkins, assistant director of the lab, made her work with DNA. Franklin took several crystallographic photographs of DNA there, but they were unable to interpret them completely. On the other hand, in Cambridge, James Watson and Francis Crick were trying to determine structure of DNA. On an occasion in 1952, Wilkins showed a crystallographic image the famous photograph 51 to Watson. From another source, Watson got some unpublished reports of Franklin's work. Brilliant Watson could realize the patterns readily. Then Watson and Crick proposed Franklin and Wilkins to work together. But Franklin was not really interested. After that, 
Watson and Crick erected a model of DNA. Separately, Franklin deduced that DNA was double-stranded. Both of their works were published in Nature on the very 25th April 1953. Honoring this event, 25th April is now observed as the DNA day. Now, uh, there's been a huge controversy about their contributions and acknowledgements. Franklin was diagnosed with cervical cancer in 1956. She died in 1958 at an age of only 37 years. Watson and Crick used data and photographs by Franklin but never acknowledged her. In 1962, Watson, Crick and Wilkins received Nobel Prize in Physiology for their work. Many groups say that Franklin deserved the Nobel since her contribution was crucial. But uh, maybe it is death that cheated her. It must be mentioned here that Nobel is never awarded after death. Therefore, uh, Rosalind Franklin became the dark lady of DNA. The research work with DNA was accelerated by the elucidation of DNA structure. Remarkable landmarks in the field kept on appearing in later years. In 1977, Frederick Sanger developed a rapid DNA sequencing technique. It is currently known as the Sanger method of determining the order of bases in a strand of DNA. Then comes the interesting story of Carrie Mullis, the inventor of polymerase chain reaction PCR. In 1983, Mullis was working as a chemist for Cetus Corporation, one of the first biotechnology companies. That spring, according to Mullis, he was driving his vehicle one night uh, late with his uh, girlfriend, who was also a chemist at Cetus, when he had the idea to use a pair of primers to bracket the desired DNA sequence and uh, to copy it using DNA polymerase, a technique which would allow rapid amplification of a small strand of DNA and become a standard procedure in molecular biology labs. Cetus took Mullis off his usual projects to concentrate on PCR full time. Mullis succeeded in demonstrating PCR on December 16, 1983. He received a $10,000 bonus from Cetus for that invention. Nevertheless, in his Nobel Prize lecture, he remarked that the success didn't make up for his girlfriend breaking up with him shortly before. So sad for a great scientist. Another interesting work is gene therapy. After extensive research on animals throughout the uh, 1980s, the first gene therapy was demonstrated in 1990, which was widely accepted as a success. In this trial, Ashanti de Silva was treated for ADS kit, which is severe combined immunodeficiency. DNA has also proven its worth in other aspects. In forensics, DNA analysis began with an interesting story. Charged with the rape and murder of a nine-year-old girl in 1984, Kirk Bloodsworth was convicted and sentenced to die in gas chamber in Maryland, USA. From the beginning, he proclaimed his innocence. He was granted a new trial because his prosecutors improperly withheld evidence. But the second trial also resulted in conviction. This time, it was life imprisonment. While in prison, Bloodsworth read every book on criminal law in the prison library and persuaded a new lawyer to petition for the then innovative DNA testing. In 1994, sperm sample from the victim's underwear was tested and the results were negative for Bloodsworth. After almost nine years in one of the harshest prisons in America, Kirk Bloodsworth was vindicated by DNA evidence. He was pardoned by the governor of Maryland and has gone on to become a tireless spokesman against capital punishment. Interestingly, after building a criminal database in 2003, the real criminal was found to be already in prison in the cell right beneath the one where Bloodsworth was kept. The Bloodsworth tragedy sparked the beginning of forensic DNA analysis. One of the most remarkable landmarks regarding DNA was the Human Genome Project. This project started in 1990, funded by the US government. 
The HGP's original plan was a $3 billion 15-year project that would be completed in 2005. Over 1,000 researchers, including 16 institutions across six nations, were involved with the HGP. Through rapid technological advances and worldwide efforts, the team could draw a draft version by 2001. The complete decoding of the all 3.2 billion base pairs were done by April 2003. Coincidentally, that was the 50th anniversary of discovery of DNA's molecular structure. Apart from AGP, the famous Craig J. Venter and his institute, Celera Genomics, took a similar private approach. They also published their draft along the AGPs in 2001. In this post-genomic era, DNA is bringing about more and more miracles. Synthetic biology, the hottest name in molecular biology nowadays, for example, has made what was once thought of as impossible possible. In 2010, a team of scientists led by Craig J. Venter synthesized a genome and replaced the genome of a bacteria with it, making a completely new life form in the process. By doing so, they essentially created life, which is considered as a great leap in the history of biological science. But it is also a rather controversial topic. Venter didn't stop there and has continued on conducting impressive researches in the field of synthetic biology. Very recently, in March 2016, they created bacteria with only 473 genes, which is making geneticists wonder about the bare minimum number of genes required for life. But wonders of synthetic biology doesn't stop here. DNA consists of four nucleotides. But what if there were more? Steven Brenner's team answered that question in 2015, when they successfully incorporated two more nucleotides dubbed P and Z, which can be used by living bacteria and replicated successfully. Six nucleotides can hypothetically encode 216 amino acids. However, they have yet to create corresponding mRNA and amino acids for those nucleotides. Meanwhile, the world of biology has been abuzz with the prospect of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technique, discovered by Jennifer Dodna and Emmanuel Charpentier in recent years. Its high-precision genome editing capability has made it the most promising tool in genetic engineering. The CRISPR method is based on a natural system used by bacteria to protect themselves from infection by viruses. When the bacterium detects the presence of virus DNA, it produces two types of short RNA, one of which contains a sequence that matches that of the invading virus. These two RNAs form a complex with a protein called Cas9. Cas9 is a nuclease, a type of enzyme that can cut DNA. When the matching sequence, known as a guide RNA, finds its target within the viral genome, the Cas9 cuts the target DNA, disabling the virus. Over the past few years, researchers studying this system realized that it could be engineered to cut not just viral DNA, but any DNA sequence at a precisely chosen location by changing the guide RNA to match the target. And this can be done not just in a test tube, but also within the nucleus of a living cell. Once inside the nucleus, the resulting complex will lock onto a short sequence known as the PAM. The Cas9 will unzip the DNA and match it to its target RNA. If the match is complete, the Cas9 will use two tiny molecular scissors to cut the DNA. When this happens, the cell tries to repair the cut but the repair process is error-prone, leading to mutations that can disable the gene, allowing researchers to understand its function. These mutations are random, but sometimes researchers need to be more precise, for example, by replacing a mutant gene with a healthy copy. This can be done by adding another piece of DNA that carries the desired sequence. Once the CRISPR system has made a cut, this DNA template can pair up with the cut ends, recombining and replacing the original sequence with the new version. 
All this can be done in cultured cells, including stem cells that can give rise to many different cell types. It can also be done in a fertilized egg, allowing the creation of transgenic animals with targeted mutations. And unlike previous methods, CRISPR can be used to target many genes at once, a big advantage for studying complex human diseases that are caused not by a single mutation, but by many genes acting together. These methods are being improved rapidly and will have many applications in basic research, in drug development, in agriculture, and perhaps eventually for treating human patients with genetic disease. The tale of DNA, the miracle molecule, extends from the beginning of life to us discovering it and gaining control over it. But the tale isn't finished yet, hopefully. As we are faced with grave and daunting challenges such as climate change, we must innovate to survive in the ever-changing world. And knowledge of DNA will grant us the ability to engineer our crops to thrive in harsh conditions. Produce biofuels when fossil fuels sources are depleted. Devise novel ways to treat all kinds of maladies. Fight aging. Store unbelievable amount of digital information in tiny hypothetical DNA hard drives. Engineer organisms to remediate environmental pollutions. And modify our genome and redefine humanity itself. No one fully knows what the future might hold but it can definitely be hoped that the future world will be green and filled with wonders. And humanity will finally learn to treat the planet with the love and respect it deserves. The last part, however, is not in the hands of geneticists or biotechnologists, but in the hands of all of mankind.